Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Yeah, get the Lord a clap. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We're back in the house of the Lord. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to see everybody. Amen. Good to see Terry. Amen. Good to see Leroy. Good to see everybody. Amen. It's wonderful to be in God's presence today. Amen. I'm excited about the sermon today and the message because it's, um, it's going to be the wrap-up or the end of the series on community. Um, community is a wonderful thing. We always have to remember that God did not design us to live alone. He did not design us to be by ourselves. He did not design us to be um, where it's just us. You know, I think about um, back in the days where, where video games were, you know, when they first started coming out. Some of y'all remember that, the Atari 2600, and, and then they came up to the ColecoVision and all these different things. This is, I'm, I'm dating myself, but that's all right. Amen. But, um, but when we did that, there was something about, you know, when you play by yourself, it was fun. But it was something about when that friend came over. It was something about when you got to beat somebody down and it wasn't just you and the computer anymore. Amen. The computer made you strong and better, but when you play that person, that level of competition, just the fellowship, God wants us to be in community. You think about when you go out to eat. If you go out to eat by yourself, it's kind of lame. You're sitting there by yourself and, you know, you get your grub on and you eat and you have a good time and you, and you enjoy your own company. I can enjoy my own company, but it's different when somebody else is there with you. You have that fellowship time, you have that talk time, you, you um, share what went on in your day. And even people who are single, anybody single out there in the house, amen? If you're single, you, you won't want to be single for the rest of your life. You want to be with somebody, amen? And, and I understand that. I was single again. I was single for 10 years before God blessed me with a, with a, with a wonderful wife, which he, which he just left. But <laughs> amen. But it's, it's a blessing to have God in, um, in our lives. It's a blessing to have community. And, you know, in, in communities, one of the things that we would always say growing up, and, and I still hear people say it about raising children, it takes a village to raise a child. Amen. So in other words, it takes community. So you can't do it by yourself. You need that strong uncle. Amen. When the kids get a little bit too big for you and, and you know, and you, you pick something up and have to knock them out, and you need that strong uncle to come. You need that, that, um, that, that sister-in-law. You need that, that sister to come and to deal with the young daughters and, and all of these type of things. So community is very important, and it's very important in the eyes of God. So today we're going to talk about the things we've learned. So we've been through this sermon series for a while. Um, I think this is the seventh message in this, this series of sermons that we talked about community. But um, we're going to talk about what we've learned. It's always good to do a recap. Amen? You know, I think about the, um, the first five books of, Mo- the, the books of Moses um, from Genesis um, to Deuteronomy. And, and one of the things that was a reoccurring theme all through those verses of Scripture and all through those um, books was that remind your children the things that I've done for you. Remind people how God delivered you. Remind people. It's a reminder. Church itself is just a reminder of what we're supposed to do. You know you're not supposed to lie. (laughs) Amen. You know you're not supposed to cheat, but it's something about when you hear it again. That reiteration. Amen. We have to always make sure that we go back and understand what we've learned. Even though you may have read the Bible from cover to cover. But we should read it often. We should read it daily. We should read it all the time. Because, again, it's the reiteration of things that we need to do. Amen. And understanding what we've learned. So God doesn't want us to learn things and just forget the things that we learn. But we're to constantly do this reminder and be in church and fellowship with God's people. Okay. So before we begin, begin, let us um, have a moment of prayer. Father, we just thank you right now for your goodness. We thank you for each one that's here. God, we just pray now that you bless the word of God as it goes forth, God, as we explore and we learn um, and just go over the things that we've learned through this series of sermons. God, we pray through this whole ordeal and through the whole series of sermons that we went through in this last one that we can understand the importance of community, that you did not just give us community for us to, to, um, to just put it aside. And that's for somebody else, but it's not for me. But God, it's for all of us. You want us to be together as one. And God, I just pray now that you bless each one that's here. God, we pray for our state. God, our state is facing a a, a strange time, many wildfires and different things. We pray for the people in Oregon who are facing what they are. We pray for the people who are down south with the hurricanes and one of the worst hurricane seasons that there ever has been. God, the world is going through birth pains. But God, we know that you are faithful. And God, no matter what we go through, you promise to be with us. And God, we're expecting you to be with us always until the end of this age. 
God, once again, we thank you, we honor you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, it's wonderful to be in the house of God. For those who watch it online, we're, we're glad you're here. Amen. we um glad you decided to watch and tune in. We know that you could probably tune into any other church service um, in the world. You can. But we thank God that you're a part of the Lighthouse family and the Lighthouse body. Amen. So we're going to go over again talking about what we've learned. We've learned a lot of things when it's talking about community. Now, in community, understanding that God wants us to be together, together as, as one, amen, not just individuals. And yes, we are individuals, but there's something about coming together. And I think about the book of John, John chapter 17, when Jesus, told us, when Jesus was praying for his people. He prayed for the disciples first, then he prayed for all believers in general. And when he prayed for the believers, he made a statement. This is a very powerful and strong statement. He said, Father, I pray that they can be one as you and I are one. Now, sometimes people don't get that, especially when people have a different doctrinal statement in their church and they believe that different things, that the Holy Spirit, God the Father, they are one, but they all are not one person. Just like we are all not one person, we're individuals. But God wants us to think as one. Amen? God wants us to work as one. When we're doing something, this shouldn't just be everybody standing back. I'm not talking about a union job. Now, you know how those union jobs, you ride by the highway and there's 20 guys standing there watching and there's one guy working his butt off and he's sweating everywhere and everybody's just there watching or they're talking or they're hanging around the water cooler. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about when somebody's working that we all jump in, that we all pitch in, that we all help. We don't just sit back and watch everybody else work, but we're to get our hands dirty also. Amen? We're to, to do something also. Don't just let that person do everything. I want some of that blessing also. I want to be involved in what God is doing. I want to put my hands to the plow because God has called us to be together and to be into community. Jesus said to be one as I and the Father are one. He told them to be one. One in what? One in our thought process. One in community. One in knowing what we're going to do. There's something about when everybody's synced up in one, on one page. And um, I don't, I don't want to keep going to sports, but, but the Lakers, when they first started playing the playoffs, they weren't on one page. They weren't in sync. But now they got it going. Amen? Now they're going to whip some clippers. They're going to whip everybody. But anyway, they got it going now. And I'm looking forward to them winning the championship because they're playing together as one. Amen? And that's one thing as a, as a body, we think about individuality. Yes, you can get some things done by yourself. But it's different when everybody comes together, when everybody bombards a neighborhood with the gospel of Jesus Christ, when everybody's passing out a track, when everybody's inviting somebody to church, when everybody Everybody's saying, hey, have you met Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what he's done for me. There's something about that community. We have to understand the importance of community. So what did we learn? We learned about worshiping together. What we've learned about worshiping together. Now, there's a few scriptures here I want to read. So um, as you hear, and if you're taking notes, I'm going to make sure. Well, it's, and it's going to be on the screen. We're going to talk about certain things, and we, we've broken this down into um, five different sections about the things that we've learned. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is we've learned what we've learned about worshiping together. What we've learned about worshiping together. Worship is powerful. Worship is contagious. Can it, is it just me? Or, or, or It's contagious. It's powerful. I think about when I walked in here and... Um, you know, there was some, some different things. And I don't like to, to look at what other people are doing because when I worship God, I, I want my heart and my soul and my mind to connect to the Lord. So, that, you know, sometimes people go to church, and I get it. When you first get there, you're looking around, and you want to see how everybody else works because you don't want to seem like you're out of, out of place. I understand that. But when you're part of the family, you're not out of place. Amen. You can get your praise on. That's one thing I, don't, I try not to do. I try not to, um, to limit how we worship. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some things that you shouldn't do. I get it. Sometimes people get happy, and they used to call it getting happy when I was growing up. You get happy, and you, you get up, and you run around the church and all that. There's a place for all that. But sometimes, sometimes people just want to be seen. 
You're not doing that because you, you, you're, you're feeling the spirit of God. You just want to be seen. Oh, look at how high he can jump. Look at how fast he can run. Oh, he just took off around the church. And sometimes people just want to be seen. And Jesus said when you do that, when you do things so other people can see, then you have your reward. But it's something about when your heart swells up with love for God. It's something about when you're genuinely happy and you, you, you know that God has been good to you and you know God has blessed your life and you cannot contain yourself. I think about when David danced before the Lord with all of his might. He didn't care who was looking. He didn't care who was watching. He didn't care what was going on. He said, man, I'm going to dance before the Lord because God's been so good to me. And sometimes we have to do that. We have to put aside what we think. We have to put aside what we feel. We can't look at everybody else. God has blessed me and been so good to me. I can't help but to give him praise. So what we've learned about worshiping together, Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. Again, when you do something by yourself, it's one thing. But when you're together, and sometimes people think about, they, they're, they're so concerned about who else is coming. Remember when you were, were growing up or, or you went to parties or who all is going to be there? Who all is coming? I, I want to know who's going to be there. But it's something about when you gather together in the name of the Lord. He said we're two or three. It doesn't matter how many people that it is, but there's something about when there's more than one person there. The Lord says, I'm in the midst of them. Now, you can believe what you want to, but I genuinely believe that if I'm there and somebody else is there and we're talking about God, we're fellowshipping about the Lord, we're breaking open the scriptures, and the Lord is right there with us. And sometimes, and it's a blessing when you can feel his presence, you know he's there with you. You know that he's there to bless. You know that the word of God is being broken forth. You know that there's a blessing when you come together because that's what the Lord wants from us. So we've learned that about worshiping together, that when you come together, the Lord will be with you. That's why I want to just let everybody know, be a part of a small group. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord with me as much as I can have him with me. Not saying that he's absent sometimes. But there's something about when you come together. Amen. Now we're going to go to um, Psalm chapter, again, what we've learned about worshiping together. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad, not I was mad. Because <laughs> sometimes people come to church mad. And I'm talking to myself, too, sometimes. Man, if them kids don't want to get up, if somebody runs a stop sign. Now, understand this. The devil is trying to do everything he can to steal your blessing from coming to the house of God, to steal your blessing from worship. Have you ever un thought about that? It seems like all of these things come up right before you go to church, or is it just me? Amen. Somebody called with some, some kind of problem. Somebody called with the issue. That's why one of the things I always tell people, man, right before I preach, I, I appreciate you. I love you. But please let me preach first and talk to me afterwards. Amen. Unless it's a life and death situation. I'm not saying you can't talk to me. Amen. But I'm saying don't come to bring some serious thing to me before that. And it's the same thing before I go to come to church. I want to be have a clear mind. I want to have a clear heart. I want to be engaged in worship. He said I was glad glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of God. You know, many times people don't experience the blessing that they need to in worship because their heart is not in the right place. They're not glad. They look at coming to church as a chore. Man, I, I want to be here. I Amen. Praise God. I want to be in the house of God. Like I always say, wild horses could not drag me from the house of God. And if I got to praise God by myself, I will. Amen. I've preached to chairs before. It's just been me and my family. But guess what? As long as I'm in the house of God, and again, going back, where two or more are gathered, uh, the Lord was right there in the midst of us. Uh, there's something about it. We don't want to inhibit our worship uh, because we have the wrong attitude uh, or the wrong mindset. Uh, we're coming because somebody made us. Uh, we're coming because somebody forced us. Maybe that's why we didn't get anything as children when we came to church. Just think about that. 
He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us. Again, community, together. So about worshiping together, God wants us to worship together. All right, so what we've learned, um, that's what we've learned about worship. So what have we learned about fellowship? But again, going back to worship. Saints, you can experience a wonderful move of God when your heart and your attitude is in sync with God. Think about it in the book of Acts. There was something about it. Things happened. It said that everybody was there in one place. They were in one accord. What they mean by one accord was everybody had the same mindset. They were there to worship. I wasn't there to show off my new shoes, even though these ain't new. Amen. I wasn't there to show off my new do. Again, sometimes people come to church for the wrong reasons. I wasn't there to get a man or woman. Let me, let me hide on that one. <laughs> I wasn't there for that reason, but I was there to get what I need to get from God. I was there to get my spirit blessed. I was there to be resurrected, so to speak, because there's a long, hard work week ahead of me, and I want to make sure I'm powered up. I, I want to make sure I'm charged up. I, I want to make sure I get my praise on uh, because that will propel me into the week. Uh, and when the week starts going good, uh, and when the week, even if it's going bad, I think about hump day, oh, when's it coming? You don't want to get up. You don't want to go to work. You don't want to do these things. Uh, but you can go back to that worship. Uh, and maybe you can hear it on the radio. Uh, you can turn back what God was doing in that service. And it'll take your heart back. It'll take your mind back. And it'll bless your soul. Uh, that's what we've learned about worshiping together. We got to worship together. And again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get your praise on by yourself. Because I do it all the time. But it's something about when we come together. All right, so what we learned about fellowshipping together. Now, we learned some things about fellowshipping together. Fellowship is always important. It's an integral and a very important part of being a Christian. I always say this. In, in one of the seminaries I went to, there were three things that they said that you need as a Christian or you will not make it. You won't serve God very long. You need to read the word. Amen. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You need the scriptures. The second thing you need is prayer. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can't do anything. And when you sever a vine from the branch, I mean sever a branch from the vine, it dies. So if you don't have a constant relationship and connection to God, then you're going to eventually die. And fellowship is the same way. You need fellowship. You need like-minded believers. You ever been going through something and was like, man, this is so hard what I'm going through, and I don't think anybody understands, but then you talk to that brother or sister that went through the same thing, and they came through that problem victorious, and God allowed them to minister to you, and it blessed your soul in such a way where you felt this renewed strength, where you felt this renewed power, where you felt this renewed vigor because God allowed somebody to pour into your life. We have to be open to that. That's one thing that we need to know about fellowship and together. You need fellowship. You need it. You're not going to make it without it. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, but as, as I'm sorry, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members one of another. You think about your body parts. Your body is one, but it has many members. You have fingers, you have toes, you have legs, you have arms, um, you have different th ears, eyes. It, if one of those things is missing, your body feels it. You feel it. It affects you. You can't see it, but the other day I was, I was making and cutting something, and the knife slipped and cut my finger. And, man, that thing's been bothering me ever since I cut my finger. That little thing, and it's the same way in the body of Christ. Sometimes people feel like they're insignificant. But I'm going to tell you something. When you're not here, I miss you. And I know when you're not here. That's why I always, amen, praise God. 
I may not always come and beat your door down when you're not here. I may not always pick up the phone and give you a call, but you can rest assured this one thing, that I am praying for you. And understand this. Always remember something about fellowship. Fellowship with people is great and it's important, but you need more fellowship with God. And sometimes when you're fellowshipping with God, and I, I know I'm not the only one that this happens to, God will put somebody on your heart. God will put somebody on your mind. That's not just coincidence. He's doing that so you can pray for that person. He's doing that so you can check on that person. He's doing that so you can make sure that person is okay. That's the thing about community. That's the thing about togetherness. That's the thing about fellowship. When someone's not around, check on them. Well, that's the pastor's job. What do you think God has you here for? We're together. It's like if the Lakers said, well, it's LeBron's job to score and nobody else's. They wouldn't win. Or it's James Harden's job, which they tried, but amen. Everybody else got to score too. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so about fellowshipping together. We're all members of one body. We're together. We're part of each other's body. We're God's people. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's very, 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 a very important scripture. If you walk in the light as he in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So if you don't have fellowship with one another, does that mean you're not walking in the light? Because when you think about it, what divides our fellowship what separates our fellowship the enemy does we let stupid things divide us and make us separate from each other and, and break our fellowship things that don't even silly things I'm gonna tell you I've heard some of the silliest things and when God plants you in the church before you move or before you uproot yourself and go somewhere else, you need to pray about that. Now, I know churches, a lot of churches don't talk about this and say much about it, but it's a real thing because God wants you in a certain body. He knows who your pastor needs to be. Some of y'all can't, can't go to a church where the guy's up there, well, God loves you and he's on your side. You can't, you can't sit there under that. Amen. I couldn't. I needed somebody that was going to be in my face screaming, pointing. That's what I need. Amen. Just like when I played football, I didn't need a coach that was going to be like, you can do it. Come here. Let me tell you. Next time you need to. Do I need somebody. Hey, you need to make sure. Get down. Get. I needed that. Amen. And sometimes God, God knows what we need. But some people need that one pastor that's going to be, oh, it's okay, brother God. Some people need that. We're all different. That's why there's all kind of churches for all kind of people because we're all different. Amen? And the thing is that God wants us to understand that when we're in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Don't let stupid things break your fellowship with your brothers and sisters. And the Bible lets us know if you have art or a problem or an issue with your brother, go to him. Don't go to everybody else telling everybody else what he did to you. Or what she did to you. Girl, you know what she did? That's why I don't even want to go to that church no more. Because if one person can stop you from going to church, what, what is that? And you always hear the saying, there's so many hypocrites in the church. But what I, I heard a preacher say this one time. If a hypocrite stands between you and God, then he's closer to God than you are. <laughs> Amen. Amen like saying I'm not going to go to work because I don't get along with that guy no or I'm going to move out of my neighborhood because I don't get along with my neighbor no you have things invested in your home amen 
You have things invested in your uh, where you go to work at. You have things invested. You have a 401k. You have children that are depending on your income. You have a wife that's looking to you to bring home some bacon, some cheese, some, some mayonnaise or whatever. Amen. You have people looking to you, and you can't just uproot yourself and move because somebody irritated you. And it's the same thing in God. You have things invested in the kingdom of God. What about your faith? Uh, what about what God has done in the past? We can't just keep uprooting ourselves and moving ourselves because somebody irritated us. I'm going to clap on that. Amen. I've seen people leave churches for the dumbest reasons. Well, I was on this committee, and, and my vote didn't count. They didn't like my vote, and, and because I wanted the chairs blue, they made them green. I'm leaving. Really? I mean, it's comical, but, but it's really sad, too. Because you know what you do? Sometimes people, let me tell you something about the enemy. We have an enemy. As a Christian, me and you have a common enemy. His name is the devil, Satan, Beelzebub, whatever you want to call him. He goes by many names. Amen. But the thing about him, he understands that if he can divide you and conquer you, that he, if he can divide you, that he conquers you. And the devil cannot read your mind. Did you know that? God can. As a matter of fact, when you go back to the, um, to the gospel accounts with Christ, Jesus often told people what they were thinking. And it blew them away. It was like, man, this dude know what I'm thinking. God knows what you think. But the devil does not know what you think. He goes by what you do. And I heard somebody say this before. Once you get the, the run in you, you're going to always be running. You ever seen people that can never be comfortable in any church? They have to go here. They have to go there. If they do something I don't like, I'm going to pick my stuff up and I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. That's a problem because what happened is the devil can't read your mind, but he looks at what you're doing. And when there's always something small and, and insignificant that's going to irritate you, in order to get you to leave, he's just going to allow somebody to, to do that little thing that irritates you. He'll make the wrong circumstances come up, and guess what? He'll just get you to get, get, get your stuff, and you'll get up, and you'll leave, and you'll go somewhere else. And when you keep doing that, you'll never grow. I'm talking about fellowshipping together. You're not going to run me out of my pee patch, so to speak. No, it's not going to happen. I told a dude this one time. I said, man, I was here before you. <laughs> I'm not going to leave. If anybody goes, it's going to be you. <laughs> I told my wife that one time. I said, I'm not going nowhere. You know, when you first get married, everything ain't, ain't perfect. And even if you've been married a while, it still ain't perfect. <laughs> Amen. But every once in a while, there's something. And, and you know, but, but some things are always off the table. But there was a couple of times when we had, had some little heated discussions, especially when we first got married. I said, look, let me tell you something. I said, if anybody goes somewhere, it's going to be you because I'm not going nowhere. She was like, well, I'm not going nowhere either. I said, well, we just going to be staying together then. <laughs> Amen. And that should be our attitude with the house of God. Amen. God is the one that led you here. Amen. God is the one that led you to Lighthouse. You shouldn't allow somebody else to make you leave because of something silly and stupid and insignificant. You should be strong enough. You should be man enough. You should be woman enough to say, you know what? God has placed me here. I'm not going to uproot myself. I'm going to stay planted. I'm going to be like that tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Amen. It didn't say the tree kept getting dug up and kept getting moved. He said that tree was planted by the rivers of water. Being planted is one thing. Now, it's one thing if the church closes down. Amen. It's one thing if the preachers start doing crazy stuff. It's one thing if they start going against the Bible. But it's another thing when there's little silly things like stuff that you just don't agree with. About fellowshipping together. What, what we've learned about fellowshipping together. He said, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. So that's what we learned about fellowshipping together. The next point, what we've learned about growing together. What we've learned about growing 
together. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, there's two components to that, grace and knowledge. The issue with that is sometimes people only get one of the two. They have the knowledge. They can beat you down with the Bible. They can tell you what the Bible says. They can show you through Scripture how this needs to be done and that needs to be done, but they haven't done it themselves. The grace is not there. Because when you have grace, you won't be critical towards everybody because you realize that you are in the same position at one place in your life also. When you have grace, when a brother or sister stumbles and makes a mistake, you just pray for them. You don't just kick them while they're down. Amen? When you have grace, you realize that, God, if it wasn't for your grace, if it wasn't for your mercy, where would I be? Thank you, Lord, that you had grace on me. Thank you, Lord, that you had mercy on me. Thank you, God, uh, that when I didn't know everything, that you made up the difference. Thank you, Lord, uh, that when I did wrong, uh, that you forgave my sins. Uh, thank you, Lord, that that grace was always there to to help me in the time that I had need. Again, sometimes people don't have both. They only have one. They have the knowledge. And some people just have grace, but they have no knowledge. The Bible is sitting on their coffee table collecting dust. The last time they picked it up was when Grandma Susie passed away. And they took it to the funeral, and they came back and set it right back in the same place, and it's been there for the last three years. They have to go together. Amen? We have to have both. He said to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So what we learned about growing together. He said, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Now, how often does a a newborn babe want to eat? All the time. And when they don't, they start crying. Now, a lot of times people think that the scripture is talking about when you're a babe, you just need to desire the word. But since when do we get to the place where we stop desiring the word? You should never, amen, amen, Doc. You should should never get to that place. You should always be desirous of the word. Like I always say, anywhere and anytime you can get the word of God, get it. Anytime the church doors are open, be there. Because there's something about God. Sometimes you don't receive a revelation from something until you're in a certain place, until you're ready for that in your life. Because sometimes you can read. Have you ever read over something and it was just vague? But then when you went through that issue in your life and you say, oh, that's what the Lord was talking about. That's what I need to do. That's what I need to change. There's something about the sincere milk of the word. And he said that you may grow thereby. So when you stop desiring the milk of the word, your growth stops. It's a fact. When you stop having that hunger to go to the house of God, when you stop saying, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. When you stop, oh, that's just Bible study. Oh, that's just small group. Oh, that's just church. I, I, I was there last week. It'll be okay if I miss one. What are, are you, you stop desiring the milk of the word. So your growth immediately stops. One of my dogs just had puppies. And you know, in every litter, there's a small puppy. They call it the runt of the litter. Now, we got this one little, this little scraggly-looking puppy. <laughs> and, and, and he's not growing. So I began to do certain things to help his growth. What I would do is I would move some of the other puppies so, so, so he could nurse. And when he wasn't nursing, I went to the store, and I got something. And I, it's, it's a um, solution that they give to give the the puppies more calories and to to give them growth and strength and all that kind of stuff. But I went and purchased this to help him grow because he's not growing. I could see that the puppy wasn't growing. My wife could see it. 
Could you see it? Could you see it? The little bitty little puppy? They could, all my kids could see it. But do you think the puppy thinks that he's not growing? And that's what happens in people's lives. When you're jacked up and you don't want to serve God and you don't want the word anymore, when you stay home and you know your behind need to be in church, come on now, when you do all these different things, you may not see that your growth has stopped, but everybody else can. I always tell you, I can see when you're not praying. I can see when you're not spending time with God because your attitude changes. The person changes. You don't think it's, it's, it's gradual and subtle, but I can, as the pastor, I don't know if God just gave me spiritual eyes to see that, but I think other people can see it too. But you don't see it yourself. You ever been around somebody that stinks and they think it's everybody else but them? <laughs> I'm like, bro, that's you. <laughs> what, me? Yeah, it's you. I knew I grew up with a guy, and he, um, I don't know what made him do this, but he bought this unscented deodorant. We were close, so he told me, you know, we played football together and stuff like that, so, you know, you get in a locker, in his locker was next to mine. And I'm like, bro, you stink. I mean, sometimes, that's not, some things, that's not a nice way to say it. I know people get mad at me and stuff sometimes, but some things you can't, how could, I don't know. Some things, that's not a nice way. I said, bro, you stink. No, nah, man, but I got this, this deodorant, it's Mitchum or Meacham or something. And it's, look at it, it's, it's nice, and it's, it's, but it's unscented. I say, but you need a scent. Because <laughs> the scent I smell is not pleasant. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Some things are not a nice way to say it. You have to just say what it is. And sometimes people don't get that. Sometimes spiritually you stink. Because you haven't been praying, because you haven't been in the Word, because you go to church when the wind blows. And I'm not saying everything's about church, amen? I'm not saying everything's about reading the Bible. But they all go together, and they fit as a puzzle, and that's what we need to learn. When we're talking about growing together, we need to make sure we come together as one, because when your growth stops, it's evident and it's actually visible, and other people can see it. You don't think they can, but they can. Amen. My wife always says she can tell when I'm fasting. Because <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I guess my attitude's not the greatest. Amen. But 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 who's like super happy when they're hungry? There's a reason why Snickers made them commercials. <laughs> you seen that Snicker commercial? The people, ah! And they gave him something to eat and he was good. Now I don't know if Snickers satisfies like that, but Amen, it'll help you out. Praise God. But that's what we need to learn about, about, um, about growing together. Growth is very important. And I often say this, always examine yourself. The Bible tells you that. Examine yourself. Examine your motives. I know in small group this week, um, Sister Lorena, we talked about that. We talked about examining your motives. Sometimes people don't examine their motives. You have to examine, why did I do that? Well, they just made me mad, so I just told them what. But why? Has it been something that built up? Or you just feel like you just got to just flex and show people that you, you the man? Examine your motives. Growing together. So that's what we learned about growing together. Now, what have we learned about serving together? Serving God in his, um, in his program is very important. It's a crucial part of the church being able to function. A church can't function unless people get in and help. A pastor can't do it by himself. Amen? And I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm not going to try. I have a friend that's a pastor. He tried to do it by himself. You know what happened to him? He had a heart attack. You ain't going to kill me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you straight up. Somebody going to help. Hopefully, I got somebody that's going to help me. Amen. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because I ain't going to let these folks, I ain't, ain't going to kill me. But anyway, amen. <laughs> but, but we can't do it on our own. So what have we learned about serving together? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And we've learned very quickly that the building is not the church. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, it's taught us that the real believers find a way to worship God. 
The real believers find a way to give God praise. The real believers find a way. And yes, I get it. The government said you couldn't do certain things. But what were you doing on your own? What were you doing when, um, when they said we couldn't meet? Now they're relaxing the stipulations that say you can meet under certain conditions. And I get it sometimes. And I don't want to beat a dead horse with this thing because it's according to your faith. Amen. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But I think about Daniel. And I talked about this before through this sermon series. So if you, if you missed it, it's for you. Daniel was a part of the government. Everything was okay when he was worshiping God and he wasn't bothering nobody. Everything was all right. They let him pray and open up his window and, and turn toward, um, toward Jerusalem and stuff. By the way, do you know that's where, um, where, where Islam got that from? Did you know that? When they turned towards Mecca and kneeled towards Mecca, do you know they got that from God's people? Let me tell you something about the devil. The devil don't create nothing new. God created everything. People are worried worried about music and all that kind of stuff. God is the author. God created music. Everything on this earth was created by God. God, if if it's created, God created it. He gave or He gave us the intellect and the intelligence to create it. And anything that you use can be used for uh, for um for instrument of evil. So be careful. People always, I don't want to do that. Touch not, taste not, handle not. How are you touching it? How are you tasting it? How are you handling it? Amen? Amen. This, this stand right here, it's a wonderful tool for me to sit here and use to, um, to, to preach a sermon. But I can knock everything off and take it, and I can knock somebody's head off just that quick. It depends on what you use it for. I wouldn't do that to be a... Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But I just wanted to show you because sometimes people get it twisted. A telephone can be a wonderful tool. Amen. You can call people and, and connect with people. The Internet can be a wonderful tool. But it can also be something evil. Somebody can wait till late at night and they can turn on and be looking at stuff that they ain't supposed to be looking at. Come on now. It can be good or it can be evil. It's all about how you use it. Talking about serving together. So we work with the Lord. Do you know that we work with God? God's, the only reason that God has allowed each and every one of us to be here is so we can reach the world. And earlier in the beginning of the sermon, we talked about John 17. When you, if you go back and read that, one of the things that I love that Jesus said, I know Alex is going to appreciate this. Jesus said, Father, I pray that you don't take them out of the world. God doesn't want to remove us out of the world because we're here for a reason. Make a stand in your community for the Lord. Amen? Make a stand on your job for God. Make a stand wherever you go. The problem is that that Christians nowadays are so weak and they're not um, strong in the word. They haven't given themselves to prayer and they're not strong in God. And when something comes, every little wind of doctrine blows and they they have to hold on because they don't have any strength to stand. But you need the strength to be able to stand. When you have God in you, the things outside cannot affect you. Amen? Because God, greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. And as a child of God, you have to know that. Amen. Sometimes I'm around people and they curse and different things. And they be like, oops, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't offend you. I say, bro, you ain't bothering me. I was in the military. I've heard I, people invented curse words. I said, there ain't nothing that you can say that's going to affect my relationship with God. Because Jesus said it like this. It's not what comes into a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out. Amen. But what you need to do is learn how to get God in you. And when God is in you, the thing that you speak will be from the Lord. Uh, So what's going out is going to be blessing people. Uh, What's going out is going to be strengthening people. Uh, What's going out is going to be giving people life, uh, not death. Uh, God wants us to be strong. Know who you're working with. Sometimes we take this back seat. I'm a co-laborer with Jesus Christ. And sometimes people worry about the weirdest things. And I used to be there. 
So I got some, some, um, some grace on that. And, 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 but I realized there was a time when I was worried about the bills of the church. Oh, God, how are we going to pay the bills and all that kind of stuff? And at some point, I said, you know what, man? This is God's church. This is his work. If it closes down, it's going to be because he let it close down. And I often say this. I remember when I was in seminary, some of the preachers that I know, they prepared to go out into ministry. So what they did in preparation was, um, um, Coco, they saved all this money. I know one brother that saved $70,000 to start a church. You know what happened? God allowed him to use all of that $70,000. And after he was depleted, then God said, okay, now I'm going to show you how to build a church. Because it's not yours. (laughs) If he would have invested his money and did it, he would have thought it was him. I built this church. I did that. Anytime you go to a, a, a church and a preacher stands up, I'm the one that did this. I'm the one. That's a problem. Because Jesus said, it's my church. He said, I will, did he or did he not? Am, am I the only one here? Some, can I get a witness? He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So guess what? If the bills don't get paid because the Lord didn't want them to get paid. If somebody don't get saved because God didn't want them to get saved. But when you do God's work, you will not lack God's support because the word said that we are co-laborers with Christ. God is working with us. But he's not going to do it all. And that's the problem. People think the Lord's going to do it. Well, I'm waiting on the Lord. Well, guess what? He's waiting on you too. (laughs) Amen. People are always, God, give me this. God, give me that. What are you doing to get that? There used to be an old saying. Some of us old timers, we can remember. God bless the child that's got what? His own. Amen. And guess when God will bless you when you go out there and do something. As long as you lay on your behind and think it's going to all flow to you and, oh, I believe I got faith. Faith without works is dead. Get up and do something. Amen. I'm talking about serving together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I'm going to tell you something about people that create division. The Bible, first of all, tells you to avoid people like that. And it said, have no fellowship with them. So when there's somebody that's always around starting stuff. Some of y'all know people like that. Always starting stuff. Nothing is good enough. And they in the church. And I'm going to tell you something. God don't plant them here. Somebody else does. But what did he say? He said, let the wheat and the tares grow up together, and I'll sort them out in the end. Amen. So it's not our job to go cutting down the weeds. Amen. It's not our job to go cutting down the tares. Let them grow together. But when you understand who that tear is, when you understand what it is, because when you grow, grow up and, and you uh, pull up the tares, you're going to pull up the wheat with it also. So that's why we have to be careful. Also in ministry, when you preach, when you teach, when you do that, you can't just single a person out and say, I'm going to just preach this person under the chairs what about everybody else you're uprooting the wheat you're hurting people because of that jacked up joker that's not going to change you're talking about what we learned now um, <laughs> amen but you but people don't don't examine it they don't recognize that you got to point those kind of people out. Even if you just make a mental note, I mean, don't make a big deal out of it. But you see when people are like that. Everything's messed up. Everything's an issue. Everything's a problem. What's wrong with you, bro? Sometimes we just got to call them out on, man, what's wrong with you? Why is everything an issue? Come on now. <laughs> you always got one, right? But it's up to us to recognize that one. And as we're serving together, we can't allow one bad apple to ruin everything. As a matter of fact, that's crazy because this week 
I had some apples, and one apple in there was bad, Deacon Roberts, and I had to take that bad apple out. Luckily, it hadn't affected the others yet. Hey Amen. I'm going to go back and look at it today. But, but that one bad apple hadn't affected the others yet. But if that apple would have been allowed to stay there, eventually it would have affected all of the other apples. And that's why the Bible is so clear about we need to make sure that we're careful about who we're around. Amen. Because evil communication corrupts good manners. And like I always say, uh, good um, habits don't rub off, but bad ones do. There's a reason why they used to tell us to stop hanging around horse thieves. <laughs> Amen. It'd be kind of crazy to steal a horse nowadays, but you got some crazy folks out there. Amen. About serving together. So we said here that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he said, make sure um, by the name of the Lord Jesus that you speak all the same thing, that there's no division among you, but be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So we're supposed to be the same. Now, even though we may not agree fundamentally on every little thing, because I'm just going to be straight up honest with you, some things the Bible just doesn't say. Like going through um, Bible study. We've been in, in the, um, the, the book of, of Revelation. And in that book, there's some things that we, I mean, they're debatable. Just to be honest with you, God didn't give us every. He didn't tell us everything because you don't need to know everything. <laughs> if God could tell you how he made Saturn, what are you going to do with that? If he can tell you and how to ring, do you ever, you ever think about that? There's a planet and there's a ring around the planet that's just there and it's, and it's been there for thousands of years. Do you ever think about that? How come this ring don't just fly off like a Frisbee and the planet still stay there? But the ring is there. If God could tell you how he did that, why he did it, what in the world are you going to do with that? Some things you don't need to know. Sometimes people go meddling in the stuff that they don't need to know. That's some things I'm just going to tell you straight up. I don't want to know. My wife wasn't always married to me. I don't want to know about her past. I don't care. I got you now. <laughs> Amen. So I don't understand why in a relationship you want to go digging up that person's past and wondering what they did. Why? <laughs> I don't know. But what are you going to do with it? If God could tell you how he made Saturn and how the ring floats, what are you going to do with that? Nothing. You go around probably proud, I know how Saturn, I know how the rings flow. That's all it's going to do is puff you up with pride. That's all. That's why God does not allow us to know everything about his word. Because some things will just puff you up with pride. You walk around talking about you, I know everything. I, you don't. You don't. And you don't need to. Like I told one guy, I said, you're so busy trying to dig into this forbidden stuff. What about what you do know? What about the lies you tell? What about the cheating you do? What about the deceptions that you do? What about, what about all that? <laughs> but you want to know this other stuff. <laughs> Why? I remember one time we, we were in Florida. That was a, um, I was helping a pastor in a church, and I'm not kidding you. He did this. You can ask my wife. He preached the same message for a month straight. The same message. The same one. Same title. Same scripture, same references, same outline, same thing for a whole month. And then somebody came to him, hey, Pastor, you, you've been preaching the same thing for a whole month. Why? He said, because you ain't started living this yet. <laughs> Why do I need to move on to something different? Because you ain't got this yet. <laughs> Amen. They ain't asking no more. <laughs> but, he said, but he stopped preaching it. Amen. But the thing is that the Bible tells us that we need to be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. We need to have the same spirit. That's one of the reasons how you can tell somebody's a Christian. There's a kindred spirit. You think alike. You do things alike because you're family. I've been dying to, 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 um, to preach about this, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it here in the next couple, couple weeks probably. I want to preach about some of the major doctrines of the Bible because we need to be on one accord about that. Sometimes people think all is crazy, and I get it. You've been to different churches, and they teach different things, but you need to know what the Word of God says. Amen. There's certain things doctrinally 
that we can't waver on. Water baptism is one. That's not optional. Well, I don't want to get wet. Well, (laughs) Jesus said you need to be baptized. I don't know what to tell you. The people come up with all these different reasons. Well, nowadays it's, it's, it's symbolic because, and then they'll, they'll have a way that they, and, and they always got this weird way of saying it. Well, nowadays it's symbolic because back then it showed that they were believers and this and that. Jesus said do it. I don't need to be trying to decipher. He said do it. And I know Peter made the declaration, be baptized in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I know Peter said that, but what did Jesus say? He said, be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I'm not saying that you make a distinction whether you believe Christ or Peter, but I think Peter just thought that you would automatically give the Father his credit. I thought he, I just think he just believed that you would automatically know that the Holy Spirit is there also. I thought he just took for granted that you would automatically know that. (laughs) Because what did Jesus say? Everybody talking about what would Jesus do? We know what he did. What you going to (laughs) do? What did Jesus say? Amen. So serving together, we need to make sure that we're on the same page. And we're going to do it. Major doctrines of of, of um, of the Bible. And not my word, the Bible. I always say that. I didn't write the Bible. People get mad and stuff like, I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write it. I just preach it and live it. And if somebody asks me certain questions, I just tell you. I'm just going to answer you by the Bible. It ain't about what I think. Even this morning, somebody was trying to get me to do something. I'm like, bro, I just don't affirm that because it's against the Bible. I don't know what to tell you. You you get mad, I won't talk to you no more. That's okay. Give me some more time. Amen. All right. Well, we learned about the, re- the, um, the reaching out together, reaching out. We're supposed to reach out to our community. We're supposed to reach out to our neighbors. We're supposed to reach out to people who aren't saved. Well, preacher, how do I know that they're not saved? Reach out anyway. They'll tell you if they're not. They'll tell you if they are. But still give them the invitation. Amen? So in reaching out together, what we've learned about reaching out together, I just have one scripture here, Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 16. And this is the... Um, This is our marching orders. The church has marching orders. Amen. We're supposed to go out and reach the world. We have marching orders. Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 16. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. I'm just going to go stop there for a minute. Jesus doesn't like when you, you, you don't believe him. He doesn't like when people are unbelieving. Did he promise you to protect you? Y'all quite, did he promise you to protect you? Did he promise you to be with you? So I don't understand why there's something that we're afraid of. We're afraid of certain things. But there's nothing to fear. If it happened, it's because he allowed it. And understand this. If you don't get nothing else out of this sermon, get this. There's nothing that happens on this planet that God does not allow. You need to understand that. I remember in seminary, there was a brother, it was, he was, it was, getting, it was getting foggy and, and cloudy and stuff like that. It was lightning and stuff, stuff like that. And everybody came out, hey, bro, it's lightning. You're cutting the grass. You got to stop. He said, why? He said, God knows all about it. And he kept cutting the grass. You know when it started raining? When he finished cutting the grass. As soon as he finished, you're like, see, God knows about it. God knows I needed to cut this grass. God knows I didn't have time to do it any other time because of my job, because of classes. He said, this is the only time I have to do it. And uh, the Lord allowed him to get it done. It started raining when he finished. At some point in your walk with God, your faith needs to increase. I always say this, if I die, I'm going to die serving God. Come get me. What are you going to do when they start doing what, what happened in Daniel's day? If you're a Christian, we're going to take you out there and chop your head off. What are you going to do? Oh, God knows that I love him. No, you ain't making a stand for him. They may chop it off, but they ain't going to get it easy. 
I'm telling you, they're going to have to, <laughs> I'm going to be like, Lord, forgive me for that one, but I had to knock a joke out first. I wasn't going out like no punk. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Later he appeared to the 11. Sorry about this. But you got to stop being unbelieving. The Lord does not like that. Who do you believe, him or man? I just put my faith and trust in God and their hardness of heart. When you have a hard heart and you're refusing to change, you don't want to do nothing different. I'm going to stick my feet in the mud. I don't care. We've always done it this way, and that's the way I'm always going to do it. God does not like that. You have to be willing to change. I always tell you guys, I'm a brand loyal person, but recently I had to change soaps. The junk was making me break out. I've been using dial ever since I was a child. Just like the Murray's hair grease, just like Colgate toothpaste, just like Folgers coffee. That's what I like, and that's what I've been using ever since I was growing up. But at some point, you have to change. When you're laying in the bed in the middle of the night scratching and can't sleep and stuff, something's got to change. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I think about sometimes people's faith. They never grow. They never do anything different. They're in the same position. God does not want you to stay where you are. He wants you to come up. Amen? Amen. I love the slogan of the United Negro College Fund. He said, um, it says a mind is a good thing. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. But it also says we don't want to hand out. We want to hand up. And as a Christian, stop trying to get God to give you everything. When are you going to start believing God for what he said that he was going to do for you? Let your faith stand. It said he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Because they did not believe those who he had sent, I'm sorry, who had, who had seen him after he was risen. After Christ had risen, people saw him, but they didn't believe it. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That hasn't changed. So when you're not doing that, you're being disobedient to God. Well, that was for the twelve. Go back and read it. He who believes and is baptized, that's baptism, baptism again. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So guess what? It's not up to you to believe for them. Again, talking about faith. You can't believe for them. I know you love your kids and you may have that unsaved child and stuff like that, but you can't believe for them. As long as you showed them the way, as long as you taught them what they need to see, as long as you've been an example of a believer before their life, at some point they're going to realize, you know what, mom and dad was okay. Mom and dad knew what they were talking about, and I need to get my behind in the church and start serving God. That's what we learned about reaching out together. You're not doing it on your own. You're not by yourself. The Lord promised us that he would be with us. And if he gave you an order, that's an order. I don't see where this changed. Sometimes people try to say that the Bible ain't applicable to now the day that we live. Some things are the same. I was going to say something, but I, I, online, I, I'm, I'm going to give you all a pass. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But that's what we've learned. Amen. About um, about worshiping together. That's what we've learned about fellowshipping together. That's what we learned about growing together. We learned the same things about serving together and about reaching out together. It's been a blessing. This whole ser ser series has been a blessing. Amen. It's blessed my soul. Amen. I pray that you were blessed by it. Let your faith increase. And I know there's a, there's a certain type of faith that goes beyond the normal faith. There's a, a spiritual gift of faith. Amen. But Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, that's, that, the sky is the limit. Just believe God. You can believe other people. Amen. You can have faith in other things. People have faith in the weirdest things. This chair, I'm just going to sit here and sit down on it. I just exercised faith. I'm going to show you how. I didn't, this chair, it's possible, it's a possibility that, would, that it wouldn't hold my weight. 
It's a possibility. It's wood. Amen? It's a possibility that when I sat on it, it could have crumbled, and I would have fell on my back. I've seen people do that before, sit in chairs, not when somebody yanked it out from under you, but when, but when you sit on it in a, in a chair brace. I've had chairs break on me before. I exercise faith when I put this thing down and sit on it because I didn't look at it and examine it. I had faith that it was going to hold me up. We have faith for the silliest things, but we can't have faith in God. You have faith in your car? When you got out there, you weren't saying, what do I need to do if it doesn't start? I need to make sure the jumper. You weren't thinking about all that. You didn't have AAA on speed dial in case it didn't start. You had faith that your car was going to start. And some of you driving them Benz and Beamers, you it better start. <laughs> you sat in that car, and you, when you turned that key, you expected it to start. Well, let me ask you a question. How come you don't expect the creator of the universe to do what he said he's going to do? I believe that. Amen. Praise God. We got to have faith. Amen. Believe God. He's the creator of all things. He created us. Amen. He authored the word of God. The Bible clearly tells us man didn't write the Bible. Yes, man wrote it, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they pinned down what God said. There was no way in the world Moses knew how God created everything, but God told him. They moved as they were inspired by God. Learn how to believe God. What we've learned, have faith in God. Amen. Jesus said that. He said, you believe in God, also believe in me. He told you. He said, in my father's house, there's many mansions. I don't have no mansion here, but I got one up there. And I'm going to tell you something. When I hit the streets of gold, I'm looking for it. I'm going to go into heaven. Where are my keys at? Because I, Jesus said. Amen. Faith. We got to believe God. Amen. Daniel wasn't worried about dying. He said, man, if they kill me, they just kill me. <laughs> I'm going to serve God regardless. He wasn't sneaky. Go back and read Daniel. He wasn't sneaky. He wasn't afraid. He didn't say, well, I'm going to crack my window halfway. The Bible says he walked into his chamber of prayer and he opened his windows just like he did before. So in other words, forget the junk you're talking. I'm going to serve God. Did they get mad? Yes. <laughs> did they throw him in the lion's den? Yes. But that's all they did. Because them lions were like, we ain't touching him. <laughs> he a servant of the most high God. They couldn't touch him. <laughs> Believe God. Believe God. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and reverence to the Lord today. What we've learned. We've learned a lot about community. And saints, all the things we learned, these aren't just to get you hyped up while you're here. If so, you can take this stuff and reach the world. The time is getting short. I was just talking to my wife this morning about how it seems like the older I get, the faster time goes by. People are dying every day without Christ. But in Mark 16, he told us to go. He told us to preach. Not what we think. He said the good news. The gospel. It's good news that Jesus died for us. It's good news that we don't have to die and lose our soul. Yes, we may not live forever on this earth, but guess what? He promised us. He said that I'm going to give you a building that's not made with hands. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to give you what you need. You're going to live forever if you believe in me. have our trust and our faith in? Is it in man or is it in God? Father, right now, we just thank you for your word. God, I know it was kind of to the point and, and very blunt, but, but God, there's a real devil out there that desires to sift us as wheat. But God, you desire unity from your people. 
I just pray, God, give us the strength to stand. Not on our own devices, not on our own, in our own power. But God, let us stand on your word. God, you're the one that heals us. You're the one that created us, God. God, all things consist because of you. And God, we thank you for your word and your goodness. God, we want to pray for that one who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that you would give them the faith to believe that there is a life after this one. And God, that you've made a way of escape from the judgment that is to come. God, give them the heart, the mind, and the soul to reach out to you before it's eternally too late. Because your word still declares, God, if we confess our mouth, with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we believe, Father, that you raised your son and our Savior from the dead, it says, God, that we'll be saved. Let us have the faith to believe that. And God, receive the salvation that we don't deserve, but you promised if we only have faith in you. God, once again, we just thank you, we love you, and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all.